Good morning, friends. I said this last week already, but um, last week it was already a while since I had been, quote unquote, in the pulpit. But it had been an even longer time this morning. I was like, I don't remember standing here. In the, we, were, we weren't here. We were in next door, right? So in, in the sanctuary, in the pulpit. So I sort of had to get used to it. And I was like, oh, I forgot the, I even forgot, what is this? The, wire, the wireless mic at one point. I had to go get it from Jacinto. As I said to our um, worship servants this morning, we are in the season of Epiphany still. Um, and we are, as we started last week, into the Sermon on the Mount. So I wanted to share way back when I was in high school, and it was, I know, Donna's like, wow, not as long as you, though, Donna, come on. <laughs> it's true, it's true. So wait, why are you looking surprised, Michael? V. So way back, way back when I was in high school, there was a movie that had come out, sometimes in, I don't know, maybe even before I started high school, but it was sort of a, a, a thing, um, and I went to see it. And I, I remember it being really cinematically beautiful, like being captured by the images of it, right? But not, but not fully understanding the storyline, right? Have you ever had one of those things where you're like, wow, that's so beautiful, I have no idea what that means, right? And anyways, I remembered it, the, the images enough that the, the, the title of this movie stayed with me. And so I looked it up um, recently and I remembered that it involved two characters, Jacques and Enzo, okay? It was, it was a French film. I know, I was so artsy, right? Jacques and Enzo. And they, they were from childhood, they, were, they knew each other and they grew up together. And so the film is sort of about their friendship and their love affair, as well as their mutual competitiveness around free diving, okay? Anybody, anybody know what free diving is? Yeah, Colin, what? That's right. You, you are, the, the point is to dive and you do not take the whole oxygen thing with you, right? And when you enter this competitively, you are not only trying to go down without the tank, you are trying to go down as deep as you can. So the competition is to enter the depths, right? To go as far down as you can while you're holding just that one breath, right? Now you might be thinking, my goodness, how far can a person go, right? The average healthy person can only hold their breath for the most at two minutes. You could try it right now if you wanted to, <laughs> right? But around two minutes, you start being like, I can't, I, I gotta take a breath, right? We played this game when I was a kid and we sometimes, I do it now with the kids when we're trying to go through tunnels and you're supposed to hold your breath the whole way through the tunnel. I can't even make it through the posy tube to Alameda, okay, anymore. So I don't know, maybe I'm not so healthy. <laughs> anymore. So how far can you go in just two minutes? Well, you might be interested to know that the world record currently for how far people can get, and sometimes they do not do this just manually, they can take machines that pull them down, but they're still on their breath, is 700 feet. Okay, 700 feet on one breath. I, I don't, okay, I, I don't want to go there. And the, the world record for how long someone can hold their breath underwater, get this. Do you want to guess? 20 minutes and 21 seconds. I don't, I have no, I don't know. This, this seems crazy, right? It's in the Guinness Book of World Records. 20 minutes and 21 seconds, okay? Don't try it now because if you pass out, well, good, Steven's here. Um, so, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. Now, as you can imagine, the sport is dangerous and can lead to death, right? There's a certain depths where the pressure is so great. And so routinely at these competitions, people actually come out of the water with blood pouring out of either the eyes, their mouths, their ears, right? Because the pressure and the, the change is too great. So coming back to the movie, Given free diving was wrapped up in the plot line, lots of it was filmed underwater, right? And that's what made it partially so beautiful. Deep, deep underwater. And I remember finding this beautiful, but also terrifying. Now, I confess to you, I've always been somewhat uneasy around the ocean. I have absolutely no desire to go like deep, deep down, right? To look up and around and see nothing but water. 
The idea of being so far down that it becomes dark as night, right, is frightening to me. It's not something that I was like, whoa, that would be so interesting or engaging. The reality of being in a space with no orienting markers, right, and just to look forward and backward in every direction and only see water, <laughs> right, feels threatening to me and utterly bewildering. Being in the deep feels fraught with danger and risk, even as it is, I'm sure, filled with wonder and awe. Too many things, it seems to me, can go wrong, whether or not you have that oxygen tank or not. Now, my guess is that I'm not the only one that feels this way, right? Can you, can you, would you raise your hand if you're like, yes, me neither, I do not want to go deep, deep down. No, no, thank you. Oh, only, really? Yeah. yeah, right? Right? I'm not alone in this feeling, right? A good many of us gathered here have similar feelings about deep waters. We'd rather not go deep. The surface is good enough for us, right? The surface is good enough for us. We'd like to stay connected to the things that we know, the things that um, give us a sense of security, right? We like to see the shoreline, we like to see the palm trees, feel the, still feel the sunshine, and the ice cream truck out there in the, in the distance. We might consent to go five feet, maybe even 10 feet down, but beyond that, you are definitely pushing it. And we're not interested in pushing limits, right? Being in uncertain territory, losing control, feeling surrounded and not being able to breathe freely, no matter what new and amazing creature you might encounter by doing so. And friends, my guess is that our feelings about going deep don't only apply to water, but to other areas of our life also. Most of us are not eager or willing to go deep into our emotions, for example, especially the things that cause us pain or anger. We're not willing to go deep into our doubts and our fears, whether they're about ourselves or about the world. Because who knows, if we started getting into them, they might just get amplified and bigger. We're certainly not eager or willing to go deep into our biases or prejudices, to look at and examine our blind spots, right? Heck, most of us won't even admit that we have them. And we're definitely not eager or willing to go deep into those areas of our lives where conflict lives be they internally in ourselves or in the relationships that we have. We'd rather stay on the surface where we feel oriented and safe than to go deep where our sense of up and down can be lost and we are at risk of being swallowed. All of that feeling highly likely. So then friends, what about our faith? Do we remain on the surface of it, have a 10 feet limit, right? Or are we willing to go deep? Are we willing to dive down past the rules and commandments, past what we've heard it said, past what we think we know, what we think is right or is true, and into the deep? In our scripture reading today, it seems to me that the heart of what Jesus was saying to the crowd gathered is this. You who are salt and light, go deeper. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks. Because we know you to be a deeper, wider, broader, more expansive God than we can put our arms around or even put our minds around. We give you thanks that you do not stay on the surface with us, but that you are already in the deep. And so we pray that during this time, O oh God, you might open us to that possibility for ourselves. Invite us into the waters with you. 
Help us to come to know the deep in a new way with you. This is our prayer, O oh God, this morning, and we pray it in the name of Jesus the Christ, who makes the invitation. Amen. So as I, I shared earlier, we continue our reading this morning from the Sermon on the Mount, right? And it's immediately after Jesus had told the crowd that was gathered, right? He said to them, this was the tail end of our reading last week, I have not come to abolish the law, right? This is the the last part. I have not come to abolish the law, but to what? Do you remember? But to fulfill it, right? That is what he says. And then he illustrates this exact thing using six points that are rooted in Jewish law. These six points are known as the antitheses, antitheses, because they follow this formula. Did you hear it in what Al and Peggy read, right? They start with this thing about, you have heard it said, right? But I tell you, right? So those become the antitheses to one another. Our reading, there are six altogether, I said, but our reading covers four of them and deal with anger, adultery, divorce, and oaths, at least on the surface, right? In each instance, Jesus lifts up a law that the people would all be like, no, I'm I'm familiar with this one, right? And I'm not only familiar with it, I'm, I'm totally behind it, right? There's nothing controversial about the laws that Jesus points to. Every one of them made good sense and got the thumbs up from the crowd that was gathered. We totally agree. Murder is bad, right? That that doesn't take a whole lot for us to come up with. Adultery is ugly. Divorce must be handled properly. And false oaths are wrong, right? There's nothing, I mean, I I don't even think any of us are sitting there like, like, I don't know, Emily, right? Let's talk more about this at this moment. So true to his word, Jesus doesn't suggest that we should get rid of these laws. He does not abolish them, in other words. Instead, He goes deep. We can all agree that murder is wrong, but let's go deeper until we hit upon why people might be murdering one another in the first place, right? Could it be because anger has gone unchecked and turned into hate? Could it be because there's unresolved conflict that has simmered for far too long? Jesus goes deep and invites his followers, most of whom, like us, feel totally removed from the possibility of ever committing murder, right? To dealing with what's far below. And this is much more relevant to us, right? Matthew's sitting there like, I'm not going to grow up to be a murderer. I'm, I'm, I can probably say that with 99% of certainty. And the folks that are, Felix, I think you're the oldest person next to Walter. You're sitting there like, I did not, that was not a, that was not a temptation or a challenge for me all my life, right? All my, almost 90 plus years of life, right? Almost 90. <laughs> almost 90 plus years of life. Walter, are you with me? <laughs> right? So from the, from our youngest person in the room, our oldest elders in this room, right? Murder is not something that we're like, wow, when, when the Ten Commandments said that and when Jesus reaffirmed that, I thought to myself, this is going to be challenging, right? But here's the interesting thing, isn't it? Jesus does go deeper to the places that you and I, in fact, are challenged. We do feel angry a lot of the time. And it's true. There's stuff that is in between some of us in this very room and those at our house. And we still come to worship and we still take communion and we still leave our gifts at the table. Right? But Jesus invites us to deal with those things because he gets. Murder is at the surface level in some sense. The deeper stuff, the everyday stuff is the stuff you and I can look up. Anger is one of those things that leads to the harsh and ugly words, right? In the text, we have the person saying, Raka. We're like, Raka? What does does that mean? Or, you fool! Right? As as sort of the worst thing that can be said. I I tried to look behind what Raka means, and it was like this this word that people said but really was bad, but they could not tell any... Do you know what it actually means, right? But we can think of names that we call each other now, right? When we think about that person that cuts us off on the road or 
Um, when somebody really makes us angry, the names that come up in our minds, right? Jesus invites us to look at those and to be reconciled. Jesus makes the same move with the other rules. Not committing adultery maybe is at the surface level, is at the beginning entrance level. Go deeper and you'll find our penchant to look at one another, not as a whole human being, right? Created in the image of God to be respected and valued as such, but as objects appreciated and valued for serving our own purposes. Our penchant to do so and all the actions that are rooted in that are no different, Jesus says, than adultery itself. And this is where we might start getting nervous, right? Okay, okay, I'm not going to murder, I have no adultery, but all these things that Jesus actually begins to touch on are things that we might deal. I, I had a, actually a fascinating conversation with one who shall remain unnamed this past week because I was telling this person, a young person, about reading about this app or this site, a dating site. The adult version is called Tinder. Right? Some of you might have heard of this. And it's, it's this dating website that was Jacinto. It wasn't Jacinto that I was talking to, but Jacinto, <laughs> Jacinto clues me into these things a lot of times. Right? Tinder is like you get pictures of images of people and you swipe right or left. right? And right you like, left you don't. And you just, you're, you're basically making judgment calls on people constantly by their looks. right? I don't know, the, the popular notion or what I've heard, is this true? I'm Michelle, I, we're not looking at Michelle, Michelle knows nothing about this. But um, is that it's sort of like a, a meat market-ish kind of thing, right? But the thing that, and, and okay, I'm getting agreement, so I'm on the right track. But the interesting thing is, the, what I was reading about is, there's now a young person, a youth version of Tinder. For those between 13 and 17 years old, okay? And the interesting thing, I know, I don't know, I was kind of like, I'm finding this so gross, but the person that I talked to did not. <laughs> and um, they were, what, what the whole thing about it was that, uh, that I was reading about was that it was causing young people to ask for nude pictures of each other. And that's what was being sent back and forth, which I think happens on Tinder also, right? And so this idea, we had this very interesting conversation then about like, uh, this person was asking, well, what's wrong with that? They, they, if you ask and they send it to you, then they're willing to do so, right? Was, and I was like, I don't know. We're kind of reducing people to body parts, right? You're asking for pictures of body parts, and you don't even know the person, right? But I think this is what Jesus is trying to get at, isn't it? We don't do this just in dating apps, right? Tinder and whatever this app, this teen version, isn't the only place that we begin to objectify people. It's interesting in the text because Jesus is talking to males, right? He says, when you look at a woman, right? But in our day and age, that objectification is still very much a patriarchal thing, but it also just happens to human beings that are different from us. Go deeper, friends. It's not just about adultery. It's about our, our willingness to objectify one another. And sure, the law allows for divorce. Now, we need to say a few things about this because Jewish law, not only back then, but today, it's fascinating. <laughs> Jewish law only allows divorce to be initiated by men. Even today, if you get married religiously under Jewish law today, only men can initiate divorce. And in Jewish law, it could be for anything. In scripture, we read that a burnt dinner can cause can cause a man to initiate the divorce, right? Write the get. <clears throat> or if the husband finds another woman more attractive than his wife, and out would go the woman and her children, often into destitution. Now here's the interesting thing. We might think, oh, this doesn't happen today. There's this whole news story right now that's happening in 2013 in New York. In the Orthodox Jewish community, um, this woman was, they, they got married, they didn't know, really know each other, it was sort of an arranged marriage. Two weeks later, they're married. Nine months later, she just wants out. She's like, this, just too difficult, it's too much. And, but she can't get out because the guy won't give her the get. It's called the get, the, the paper, right? 
And so she started, interestingly, she's using social media. She's like, free, whatever her name is, free her um, to get the get. But the interesting thing is, all of the conversation around divorce and what makes for divorce. But the original idea was that it was, it was becoming this thing where people could so easily fail on their commitments. Again, reminded them of the reasons, burnt dinner, or if you look over and you're like, ah, oh, Jane's looking good today, right? <laughs> um, so then all of this stuff changes. And Jesus is inviting us to go deeper, to recognize the ways in which our frivolousness impacts others and to make different choices. And finally, with that last one, sure, the law allowed for oaths. Right? Have you made an oath lately, Ursula? <laughs> made a promise? The law even prescribed it at times. But go deeper, Jesus invites us. Isn't it true that we only need oaths because we can't, we won't, or we don't trust one another, right? We want them to do something, swear by something larger themselves because we just don't take their word. What if we dive deep into trust, dive deep into integrity, dive deep into being folks for, for whom our words counted? I think going deep is a much more difficult and challenging proposition than staying on the surface, isn't it? Going deep in dealing with our anger and all that it can turn into. Going deep in dealing with our objectification of one another in all of its forms. Going deep in cleaning up our commitments, our integrity, our word. That can get really messy and really demanding, can it? But here's the thing, brothers and sisters, it's easy, it's super easy to skate on the surface of our faith, to wade around in the shallows, believing that, hey, if I follow all the rules and commandments, that's, that's pretty much what it's all about, right? To splash about in the kiddie pool of our lives, right? Not dealing with the messes, not dealing with the complexities, not dealing with the conflicts or the brokenness. But God wants more. God invites more. And my sense is that so do we. As scared or even terrified of the deep as we are, as resistant as we are to the discomfort and insecurity of being in the deep, I think we all know somewhere in us that it is there in the deep that we will meet God, that it is there in the deep that we will be transformed and healed, that it is there in the deep that we will experience the awe and beauty of all. <coughs> that it is in the deep that we will experience all that God promises. Our goal and hope in faith. Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. Our goal and hope in faith, I hope, is not that at the end of the day that we, when we arrive, right, we say to one another and to ourselves, God, I'm so glad that I'm a better rule follower. Right, that that is our goal. I hope that our goal and hope and faith is that we come to have the heart of God. That we come to embody the love of Jesus. That we come to be enlivened by the joy of the Spirit. This goal and this hope requires that we go deeper and deeper into relationship. Deeper and deeper into community deeper and deeper into ourselves, and deeper and deeper into God. And here's what's so exciting. When we dare to do so, right? When we dare to hold our breath and dive in, we will discover a richness and a fullness of life for ourselves and our world that we cannot currently imagine. 
Scientists, I don't know, anybody who are water, people that love the water and they read all about the National Geographic stuff about it? Well, I did a lot of free, reading about free diving <laughs> this week, right? So the interesting thing is, this guy who got into free diving was, was talking about National Geographic, how actually the ocean depths are much less explored than way, way up in outer space. We know far less about the deep depths of the ocean than like the furthest, furthest star. And what he was saying is like, wow, when you go, you, you meet creatures that you just have no idea exist, right? You encounter worlds that you just don't know. That's what scientists are telling us today. And I want to suggest, friends, that that is true in our faith also. So will you go deeper? That is the invitation. Amen.